Good morning and a very warm welcome to the 2021 British Tomato Growers Conference. I'm Phil Pearson, Chair of the Technical Committee of the British Tomato Growers Association and your Chairman for today's event. The protected edible sector across Europe and the UK is facing unprecedented challenges today. Uh, I've been in our industry now for uh, over 40 years and these are the most challenging times that I've ever experienced with five-fold increases in fuel costs leading to growth across Europe, reducing production area for the 2022 summer season. Similar increases in electricity costs are resulting in already propagated plants being thrown away uh, as the cost of winter production exceeds the value of the crop. Workforce shortages as a result of the double whammy of Brexit and COVID restrictions have led to fruit shortages and world-class British tomatoes being wasted. A shortage of HGV drivers across Europe has also led to the wonderful British tomatoes being thrown away. Huge challenges then. However, as ever with our wonderful industry, we are working hard to solve today's challenges and grab tomorrow's opportunities. As a result, during today's conference, we will be covering the challenges and opportunities, including labor, with the paper given by Lee Abbey of the NFU, energy, with the issues outlined by our favorite energy guru, Tim Pratt, uh, applied research funding, where I'm going to outline the efforts that the British, that the Growers Better Levy Group are making to drive applied research for the future, uh, post-Brexit phytosanitary arrangements for the imports of plant materials, uh, which will be explained by a, a team from the Animal and Plant Health Agency. Also, uh, a favorite uh, topic, topic we do every year, which is a discussion on the retail space, with a paper from Kantar on this year's retail performance. Uh, promotion of tomatoes with our rundown of British Tomato Fortnight 2021 from, Na from Nairi from uh, Jack and Grace. And then this afternoon, we'll have a series of paper on the uh, global threat posed by the tomato brown and goose fruit virus uh, from uh, DEFRA, FERA and ADAS. Uh, and then that will be followed by a Q&A session. So, with such a full agenda, we need to get going. But before we do, just a few housekeeping points to help make today's experience better and allow you to interact with today's event. Um, the platform enables you to send a question via the chat function. This is vital because it allows us to, uh, everybody to interact with what's being said, uh, and we will endeavor to answer as many of the Q and A's as possible. And I'll try and manage those. If there's two or three that are the same, I'll try and group them as one question, et cetera. Um, however, any questions sent via direct message to the panelists may not be answered, so try and do it in, in the first, first way, please. Uh, all correspondence to our speakers must be sent via the chat function. Thank you. Recording, the, video, the live video content will be recorded and published on YouTube and the British Tomato Girls Association website, so you can look uh, in the future. If you have any technical issues, Please use the chat on the right hand side to contact the event team for support and they'll help you straight away. Uh, we encourage you to visit the expo area via the button on the left hand menu where our sponsors and trade stands who are vital for, for uh, allowing us to produce this event uh, are. Uh, they have virtual booths. This event cannot go ahead without their support. Therefore, please use the time that you have to pop in and have a look at, at their content, uh, you know, and see what's of interest to, to you. Okay, before we start, um, on the same note as trade stands, uh, we have a short video now from a sponsor of our first session, which is Britannia Coya. The support Britannia Coya bring to their product and their brand is world class. When we put an order in, no matter how detailed or bespoke or personalised it is, Botanicoia meet that requirement and it humbles me to think that you do it to such a standard with such professionalism. Thank you very much to Botanicoia for that video. Okay, as in the modern world of uh, living uh, virtually, um, 
I'm hoping next year, by the way, that we are in person, and uh, this is what I care. We've already had our first technical challenge, so we need to change the order of our first two speakers, if that's all right. So rather than welcoming uh, uh, Lee Abbey to talk on Labour, I'm going to ask our, our friend and colleague, Tim Pratt, if he would give his paper, please, on the, on the energy market and the challenges that we are experiencing. Thank you, Phil. Uh, yes, just, just like the energy markets, things have changed last minute. Um, so, yeah, a, a few months ago, I was asked to present probably more focused on net zero and hydrogen because I've been feeding into some hydrogen related consultation. And, and it was a bit of a odd point to them when I said, you know, we actually want CO2. And it was, like, oh, really? Um, of course, the need, the need for CO2 is suddenly in the headlines. But unfortunately greenhouses don't get a mention so so the my, my presentation has sort of changed a bit from from what it was perhaps originally intended to be so yes funnily enough i'm going to talk a bit about the gas price as many of you who know me uh know that i'm a bit of a fan of if you like of combined heat and power and and we've got to keep asking ourselves is it is chp still still our friend if you like in a in a co2 or, or net zero and energy costs and and, and and all that kind of thing so i'm going to run through some chp figures just to see what that looks like of course i will touch on hydrogen um it's you know, before we all get excited about the price of gas or, or the media in particular there was the hydrogen versus heat pump wars in in, in a domestic heating sense and lots of competing commercial interests let's say um so just to touch briefly on that <clears throat> excuse me and of course net zero um it's you know it's getting a grip on us if you like in that it's it's unlikely to go away like carbon footprints on packs of tomatoes did 10 years or more ago so what what are we going to do about it just a few hopefully a few tips and pointers in that regard so I, I guess that's the graph that scares a lot of people. It's the, it's the day ahead gas price over the last 10 years. And we can see you now for 2011 through 2004, it was a sort of 13, relatively stable, six, around 60 pence a firm, just nudged over a pound in, in sort of early 2013. And, you know, it's... I never, I remember sort of in early 14 thinking it's, it's never going to have a anything but a six or more at the front of the number and, and it crept under 50p and i was like wow you know sure yeah, it's, it can't, it's never going to go any further and, and and look what happened we had several years of in relative terms over the last 10 years fairly kind gas prices and off it went again went on a bit of a ride and i remember presenting the to, to the tomato conference what three years ago now and being terribly excited about what the beast from the east did and and, and how the darehead gas price went over two pounds but it was actually incredible how quickly it went back down to what you might call a normal number and and it really it was you know, it was a walk in the park in comparison to what we're seeing at the moment we were through 2018, the price was climbing, it wasn't looking good. And then almost from nowhere, gas prices came down as a result of you know, significant volumes of liquefied natural gas coming into the country. Um, in part because there was a good supply, not that much demand around the world. We had good facilities to accept those loads of gas coming in. And through 19, again, very kind gas prices. Okay, 2020, as we all know, was uh, special, let's say. Um, we know that that, that it was just a, a combination of all those circumstances around the virus. So you know, what, what's happening now? Well, to a greater extent, it is a classic supply demand crunch, if you like. Um, Asia, um, Asia is buying lots of LNG, liqu liquefied natural gas. To, to produce electricity. There's a general move away from coal in a lot of countries. So natural gas is the fuel of choice to produce electricity. Natural gas production, and particularly that coming through pipelines across from Russia and into Europe and, and through to the UK is not flowing at the levels that would normally be expected. 
um, you know, European gas storage is at is is almost the lowest it's been for for a long time. So that all builds a lot a lot of nerves into the energy market, which is what's driving up the day ahead price and the winter forwards price as well that we'll look at in a minute. Um, now I think there is a lot of nerves at right rightly so, and, and and it's kind of demonstrated just over the last week or two when. You know, gas prices can move by 10 or 20 pence per therm in a day. And a little bit of me, and, and, and it, um, let's hope it's not too optimistic or naive, just kind of thinks and hopes, and we have seen it in the past, that once we actually get into what is the winter season for gas, which starts on the 1st of October, that a lot of that nervous buying of the big companies, if you like, that have to have the cover, We've seen it before. Once we get past that point, almost things can calm down a little bit. But we are on a knife edge. You know, if we get an early summer, early summer, an early winter, um, sort of just bites a little bit in November. There's so much ner nervousness in, in, in the markets. It, it, it could set it off the other way as well. So, so as, as I've said a number of times on presentations like this, if if I or any of us really knew what was going to happen in the energy markets, we'd have made an absolute fortune by now as commodity traders and and uh, and, and would be basking in the sun of the Bahamas or, or, or whatever it may be. So, you know, we're all, we're all looking at the same thing. My feeling, my hope is that the edge will come off the market, but so much gas has come into the country at these prices, I don't see them going down to more realistic levels through this winter. We're stuck with something that's up in a big number. And, and this, this graph here, I took it from a, a UK government report and it kind of shows a bit more of the history and where we're at. You know, around 2000, we were producing more gas than we were using. We were exporting through pipelines into Europe. It was the dash for gas. It was when greenhouses in the UK first started getting a, getting a taste for combined heat and power, that's when, you know, your Nadalos, SSC, all those companies were coming along to grows and saying, hey, you know, we'll give you cheap heat and have CO2 for nothing. It'll all be great. Um, and what did we do? Well, we kind of used it all up, or a lot of it. And so now UK sourced gas is what, uh, around about half of what we need. Pipeline imports through Europe, principally Russia and Norway, have, have built up. And LNG, liquefied natural, natural gas imports, are what kind of balances it out. And the trouble is, you know, they come, it comes on ships. It can go anywhere in the world. Who, whoever offers the most money gets it. Um, so, and, and that's the position we're in. There is, you know, there's a lot of competition for LNG, and so that, that is what's setting the price. But you know, looking forward to, to prices where we're offered two, three years forwards now, now, we can see that, OK, unpleasant looking numbers for this winter. I mean, 85p for next summer um, kind of feels ever so slightly OK, bearing in mind what we're just paying. But uh, uh, And then we can see that winter 22, much better than we're currently paying, but still on the high side. And by the, the markets are clearly thinking that by the time we've gone through summer 22, we'll, we'll have caught up in the European gas storage. Winter 22, therefore, has got to be at a premium because they put expensive gas into storage as much as anything else. And by the time we get to summer 23, we're back on an even keel. And then we're seeing a prices of 60 pence a therm, which interestingly, as it happens, are, are where we were at 10 years ago. And for want of another fact or figure, the average day ahead price that we've paid over the last 10 years on that previous graphs, graph was 50 pence. So I so there is light at the end of the tunnel, but there is no questioning the pain and the pressure that this winter and 2022 that follows are, are going to put going to put on the industry. Just as a, as a sort of you know, slight aside, come potentially interesting point. If we look at the price of gas in summer 22, if we burn that gas and we only want CO2, then that CO2 will have cost us about £158 a tonne. Now, that's excluding any carbon taxes and all that kind of stuff, because it varies quite significantly from, from one site to another. Uh, that would have been, broadly, what a tonne of liquid CO2 was costing recently. But you know, we all know the story about, about CO2 and 
how fertilizer plants aren't fertilizer plants anymore, they're CO2 manufacturers and fertilizer is kind of a byproduct. But uh, yes. So I guess the question is, what can you do? And uh, yeah, unfortunately, I think the, the, the toolbox is fairly limited for, you know, price spikes of this level of the of coming with this speed. And when you look at what prices are expected to do over the next year or two, um, you know, that it doesn't even, it's not like there are some significant investments that you might make now that will make solid, reliable savings to year after year. There will be an insurance policy. And the question is, what kind of insurance policy do you want to pay for or do you need to pay for? But the here and now piece is, yes, I, I chose a round number on two pounds a therm. Burning oil is an option if you still have that option. You know, two, a two pounds a therm for gas, that's equivalent to about 71 pence a litre for gas oil. Important to note that if you're burning gas oil, you can, the horticulture can still get the heating oil duty back of around about 10p. Uh, somebody said to me the other day, I think that you know, gas oils are in sort of like 40 odd pence a litre. Um, it'd be interesting if anybody else has been pricing up gas oil, if, but if you put it in the comments, it'll be interesting to hear what, what, what kind of figures there, there are out there. Um, I put a line there saying, don't forget climate change levy, uh, UK ETS, all these sort of extra bits and bobs of potential taxation, depending on the situation of your site on your site. It can easily shift the balance by a few pennies per litre. Well, yeah, gives, give, gives you a guide, if nothing else. Um, of course, you know, how about putting in a biomass boiler or heat pump? Um, obviously, quite a few projects have gone ahead, helped significantly by the renewable heat incentive. Um, so, so, yes, if you've got that, great i'm sure you will be it will be taking the pressure off substantially but does subsidy free work well at the moment sorry i had a message from tomato conference central on my whatsapp and i wasn't sure whether it was for me or not and you, you, you'd stopped hearing me or something no sorry um yeah biomass boilers heat pumps they do even at today's gas price yes there is a saving at today's gas price but it's not that big which which is a telling message in itself um and, and the idea of yes 12 months at least to get such a such an installation going if you haven't got one already by then the edges come off the gas price or at least the forward price market says that and, and so your saving is gone so yeah it's just a it's a interesting message in a sense that in, even with the gas prices that we're seeing without some kind of support or shift in in the sort of like government policy taxation call it what you like the, these technologies they work but financially they don't add up now what usually happens is when we see gas spikes like this price spikes like this and, and, and i've had conversations with various people already it says, right, you know, what can we do? Should we be hedging? Um, and yeah, you know, I've, I've often said in previous presentations, and it's still the case, that in the long run, if you buy your gas day ahead, it's cheaper than fixing forwards because fixing forwards is an insurance policy and insurance policies cost money. There is a risk premium added to that price that you are being offered for a forward purchase. But Yes, you know, faced with price rises like this, the question is, it, 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 how can you ride through the kind of price rises we are seeing if you have not fixed forwards? Very much an individual business decision. And bearing in mind, this spike that we're seeing now is you know, easily a once in 10 year event in terms of the trends that we can see. Will it be more frequent in the future? Um, well, at the moment, the energy markets are saying no, but we won't know um, until it happens. So I suppose, yes, it's think about your purchasing strategy. Do you need the comfort having taken such a battering as, as you probably are now and, and going into next year? Is the comfort and stability of a long-term hedging strategy something that you really do need to be considering now? Only you can truly answer that. 
But long-term hedging strategies don't have to be complicated. They don't have to be difficult. Um, but again, you've got to be aware of the fact that when the prices fall, you may well have locked in at higher costs than perhaps your competitors. Um, so tough decision, tough decision. But if, if, if any of you, any of you are thinking about hedging strategies and want to talk about in more detail about how they might work, yeah, please do give me a call. Right. CHP moving on quickly. Is it still your friend? Well, from a net zero point of view, it's less friendly than it used to be. Much to my frustration, and as, as I've said before, the, the, the credit you get for exporting the electricity to the grid is based on the average CO2 intensity of grid electric. Um, and, and because there's a lot more renewables out there, it, it, it says, no, it's not worth as much in CO2 terms as it used to be. In, even though we're burning heaps of gas to produce electricity every hour of the day. I still believe that in that kind of in that kind of scenario, the, the CO2 reporting protocols are flawed, but they are what they are. And, and I doubt that the likes of you and me would, would get them changed. But it is a message that I think is technically sound and, and that, can, that the industry can still at least you know, attempt to, to make some points on. It was interesting. The government had a CHP through to 2050 consultation document last year which and the narrative of that was positive um which i think is important for us all to hear and feel and the, the text they're taking from it acknowledges that in certain situations it can reduce co2 emissions by 30 percent even though the reporting protocols don't let us let, let us you know claim that when we're doing our carbon footprint in terms of energy costs the uh, chp is still very much our friend and, and we'll have a quick look why so this is when this this shows the price of gas and electricity or peak electricity, which is 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. weekdays only and how they have moved. You know, took the start of the year gas at what, 50 pence or so. Um, I hope you know, maybe some of you had, did manage to fix gas at this level and, and, and you're sitting listening to this feeling uh, rightly uh, proud of yourself, let's say. Uh, but what really matters CHP is what we call the spark spread. That's the cost of the gas, sorry, the value of electricity generated minus the cost of the gas burned. And I've been following this for a while. And when it hit sort of the £35 number, I thought, oh, that's, I haven't seen anything like that for a while. And then it started to come down. I thought, oh, blast, I missed it. But look what's happened in the last few weeks. It's just gone absolutely bonkers. Uh, and, and the noise in it as well. Now, some of that noise of, on that line could be due to the timing of the different prices being issued that I work on. Um, but it shows you know, how what the nerves in the market are in terms of electricity as, as, as much as anything else. And if we change that into what the cost of heat produced by a CHP, allowing for modern efficiencies, a sensible maintenance cost, then if we just if we ignore the bit at the end, which is actually good news, to be fair, but the stability of the heat cost that CHP has given us through this year is so much better than just you know, burning gas in a boiler. Now we do have to keep pinching ourselves and seeing that CHP are not cheap things to buy. They have to be bought and paid for. There's, I haven't got any finance cost in this. I haven't actually put any carbon costs in this figure either. I'll touch on carbon costs in a moment. But CHP is a really good energy cost risk management tool or, or whatever phrase you might want to choose. As long as that electricity is hitting the grid, and as Phil said at the start, you know, winter lit crops are taking all that electricity, all that cost is staying on site. So a CHP will save you money versus grid electric, absolutely. But if you've got winter lights, then it, it's not going to e ease the pain that we're seeing on gas prices at the moment. And if we flip it on its head, obviously, if cost of heat from boilers is going up uh, with, with the price of gas, then actually the value or the saving that CHP is giving you on heat for this winter is almost like a mirror image of it. And yes, there we go. You know, it, it just goes to show what, what CHP is, is doing for us at the moment. And then just looking forward to summer 22, um, we can see that ultimately the prices are such that if you've got CHP that you're putting the electric on the grid, it's going to work quite nicely. I will, or I do have to recognize and emphasize that 
you know, there are investor owned CHP on, on nurseries and, and the arrangements then you know, do vary. Some are a heat fee with RPI indexation, which might be looking pretty good at the moment. Some are a heat fee based on the price of gas. So whilst the CHP is taking the edge off that cost, you, you, you know, you, I'm sure you're still going to be seeing that magnitude of change. Moving quickly on, see, I'm, I'm dragging on a bit. So carbon taxes, you know, we all know about the climate change levy um, and the climate change agreements that many of you are in that mean you pay less. It's worth noting that that runs to, through to March 25, got a bit of an extension on it. Um, but that's, that, that'll be with us before we know it. And at the moment, we don't know what's happening next. You know, it, it might be that some of my ex-colleagues who, who are listening here, I imagine, might be able to sort of add a comment if, if they know a little bit more about that. We've got carbon price support that applies to CHP that are over two megawatts. All the, a lot of these carbon costs are driving the price of electricity. And, and if you have a CHP that's less than two megawatts, you don't pay this, but you get the price, electricity price benefit as a result. Similarly, the UK emissions trading scheme, the cost of that carbon has doubled over the last 12 months. It follows very much what used to, what the EU emissions trading scheme that we used to be in. Um, so again, that has benefited CHP, that is not in the UK emissions trading scheme. And there's a reasonable amount of that. Just be aware, if you have the potential to burn more than 20 megawatts of fuel on your site, it's possible that you will be in, should be in the UK emissions trading scheme. There's all sorts of legit, quite legitimate get outs, twists and turns. We haven't got time here to, to go through all the detail. But if you think you are at or around that level and the UK emissions trading scheme is like, what's that? Then you do need to have a good look at it just to be sure because the costs are eye watering. Uh, if, you, if you were to burn 450 kilowatt hours a square meter of gas in a boiler, bulk that up to a hectare and you had to pay UK carbon costs on that, it'll cost you about an extra 40,000 pounds. Will the threshold, will the, in threshold this 20 megawatt number be reduced going forwards it's not unreasonable to think that it might be with net zero but there's no signs of that at the moment hydrogen moving quickly on i've rattled on too long already is it the future i don't think so for some time yet the uk government hydrogen strategy released a month or two ago said they were aiming for five gigawatts by 2030 Put that into perspective electricity demand is between 30 and 40 gigawatts at the moment there's a focus on industrial or chemical clusters um, so most of the hydrogen that that's going to produce is going to be used by them and we i don't see significant percentages of hydrogen being injected into the gas network nationally for a useful time period of time yet and it might even be that these projects become CO2 sources, which will be kind of handy in terms of recent news headlines and, and could even be a, be a source of greenhouses in, in due course. Right, the road to net zero, I will try and keep it short, even though my analogy says it's going to be long and bendy. Um, there will be diversions. We might hope for shortcuts, you know, another type of renewable heat incentive that some in the industry have taken good advantage of. Ugh. I'm not sure we'll get anything quite that good again. Um, and will there be some new technology that isn't quite ready for the market yet that's going to transform things for us? I think the thing is, we have the solutions already. You know, there are growers already running heating greenhouses with heat pumps, with biomass, with liquid CO2 recovered from anaerobic digesters. We can recover CO2 from biomass boilers. The trouble is, it doesn't add up financially. So we have, we have the solutions. We could do it tomorrow if the money was there. And that's the key thing. Now, where that money comes from is another matter. Um, but yes, what I've seen and heard is, is a number of people being asked to do, start doing carbon footprints, um, very much focused on what we would call scopes one and two, which are principally energy use, whether it be that direct stuff, but stuff directly burnt on your site or imports of electricity and heat. Um, I think it's useful to look at your CO2 emissions against a range of metrics because different crops obviously have different yields, have different values, and, and, and that changes what you grow changes over years. So it's, I think it's useful 
to, to consider it in a, in a variety of different ways. But at the end of the day, zero is zero per kilo per square meter per whatever. So, so we shouldn't lose sight of that. Um, sort of first steps or baby steps, as you might call it, I think I would say, no, look at look at what you're buying. Are there some small but easy wins on some consumables that give you a little bit of progress in terms of your carbon emissions? Is it reasonable and realistic to buy green energy? Well, there's a lot of greenwash going on in the green energy game. Finally, green electricity is being seen for being very pale shade. Buying green gas certificates is actually quite expensive still. Are carbon offsets the way forwards? Well, that can be a bit of an interesting game. If you ever did go down that route, I'd want to be sure that it that it was the right source and that your customers were on board with it. Tim, I'm really trying to do this to you, but could cool, we just pause your presentation just to give uh, Lee the opportunity to do his paper? I realise it's uh, messing you around, and he, you know, you're really helping us. Uh, but we we lose we lose Lee at eleven, so I was hoping to just let him do no his problem. bit, and then can we come back to you? Would that be all right? Uh, uh, absolutely, Phil. No problem at all. You, you are a star. Thank you so much, Tim. We'll speak to you in a few moments. Yeah, cheers. Yeah, sorry about that, everybody. Uh, yeah, as you've, as you've heard, the technical challenges. Next year, we're definitely doing it face to face. Lee, can I welcome you, uh, Lee Abbey from the NFU, to talk about the challenges we've got with Labour? Uh, I know you've only got a few minutes, so thank you very much indeed. No, that's fine. I, I Serious apologies. Um, it was a problem at my end, which meant this agenda had to be shuffled, and it's my fault that I also have to rush off. So um, fortunately, what I've got to talk about Labour um, will only take around about 10 minutes. And I, I will spare a few extra minutes for questions, Phil. Um, so perhaps if I can go by five past. Um, it's good to join you again. I did speak at last year's TGA conference. Um, I covered a range of things, COVID, Brexit and Labour. Um, if I'm honest, it'd be nice to talk about something else, um, but Labour continues to be the most politically challenging issue um, I've dealt with and I expect it will continue for some time yet. Um, just out of interest, I checked my notes from a year ago and at that time I suggested that 2021 will be the most difficult year yet for accessing workers. Now that wasn't some amazing crystal ball judgment um, because I think we all knew that would probably be the case, but what I certainly didn't predict was just how difficult it was going to be. So as a quick reminder of what's happened since uh, this time last year, um, after significant NFU and industry lobbying, we finally secured the expansion of the seasonal workers pilot into this year and expanded to 30,000 visas. Now that was only confirmed on the 23rd of December, which is ridiculously late and had a huge knock on impact into the rest of this season. So the lateness of the announcement meant, for example, that the two additional operators were only finally appointed at the beginning of May. And with a minimum of six week lead time to get workers into the UK, it basically meant they missed half of the season. Um, and now they've obviously have been working very, very hard to use up all of their visas through the second half. Uh, by July, the two original operators had used up all of their visas. Um, and information we've got from the operators um, would suggest that by last week, um, roughly 27,500 workers had been recruited already through the pilot scheme. But that's the recruitment process. There is still a period of time before some of them are actually due to arrive in the country. Um, and despite the lateness of the uh, two new operators being appointed, we do expect the vast majority, if not all the visas, to have been allocated before this year was out. Um, if it wasn't for the pilot, the sector would have fallen over a cliff by now. And even with the pilot, we're still seeing significant shortages across the sector as fewer EU nationals have returned despite securing pre-settled status. And COVID has clearly played a massive part in that. We're now in September and a feeling of deja vu is definitely setting in. We've still got no commitment on the pilot scheme beyond this year. And we keep getting comments from the Home Office and other government departments about looking at the domestic workforce first. Now, I'm going to come back to domestic recruitment in just a moment. Um, what this year has thrown up that none of us quite expected was the mass exodus of EU nationals from the UK. There is data which shows 1.3 million foreign workers have left the UK during the pandemic, and there's no real indication of them coming back. Now, this has actually created a crisis across the entire food and farming industry, which has resulted in the uh, images of empty shelves 
that we've seen over the last few weeks. Now, as the problems were growing through this year, um, the NFU decided to pull together a cross-industry roundtable, which welcomed over 60 attendees from, from all farming sectors and right the way through to retail, hospitality and haulage. Um, and at the roundtable, it became immediately clear that the entire industry was on a knife edge and that the market would not simply correct itself. To overcome this, we definitely need government intervention. Now, in horticulture, we well know that government doesn't act based on the pleas of the industry. We've learned this very hard through the seasonal work pilot lobbying. It acts on evidence, but even then, only if there is a political will. So the NFU, through this roundtable, ended up working alongside 11 other trade associations, and we appointed Grant Thornton to produce a review of the issues across the entire sector. The report was published at the end of August and showed that there were a approximately 500,000 vacancies across food and farming. And this was despite wage rises of between 10 or even 30 percent during the pandemic. The report also picked up on the efforts to recruit domestic workers. And we're not alone in horticulture in, in struggling to attract UK nationals. Other parts of the chain have worked with DWP to try and support recruitment, but are failing to fill significant numbers of vacancies. So I said I'd return to domestic recruitment. I think it's worth reminding what um, happened last year and, and what we're doing this year. So last year, of course, there was the Pick for Britain campaign. Um, it helped to raise awareness, but it clearly failed to deliver significant numbers of dedicated workers. There was lots of interest, but not necessarily conversion into those that actually wanted to stick out the jobs. This year, the NFU has been working with the DWP to take a more targeted approach. The reality is that local recruitment is supported through local job centres, and it's vital that this network understands the farming industry and the types of roles we have. But it's also vital that farmers and growers know best how to engage with job centres and, and what they need to do to have the best chance of success. Now, the NFU has been speaking with DWP at a national and local level every couple of weeks since the spring. And the knowledge of our sector has certainly improved and the willingness of local job centre teams to help is very encouraging. Sadly, as we expected, getting job seekers interested in short term, rural, manual roles is proving impossibly difficult. The simple truth is that those job seekers that have the right motivations and work ethic have already secured jobs and, and predominantly permanent jobs. Those that are less motivated are certainly not interested in uh, farm work uh, away from home short term. Now, I'm not writing off this route to recruitment. I do believe that we need to keep exploring to see how we can build on it year on year. But it's clearly not the answer, certainly not this year. It won't be the answer for, for a number of years to come. It'll gradually build. It won't solve our problems. So going back to the industry report I mentioned, it reached a number of conclusions and a number of key actions for government. And at the top of the list was a COVID recovery visa, which would be a cross sector scheme that would enable overseas recruitment for the next 12 months to get us over the immediate crisis. We also had an ask on the seasonal worker scheme to make the current pilot scheme permanent and to expand its breadth so that it covers non-edible horticulture, but also its depth to increase the number of visas. And then thirdly, the report asks for uh, the Migration Advisory Committee to be commissioned to review the impact of the end of freedom of movement on the food and farming industry, as it's already been tasked to do for the adult social care sector. Now, this is critical to ensuring that mid and long term adjustments to the immigration system are identified and actioned. Now, some may question why we're not publicly criticising the UK's post-Brexit immigration policy and why we're focusing on uh, a, a short-term immediate solution. Well, the truth is that the government is wedded to the new system and the principles of British workers for British jobs. So for the industry to say within just a matter of months of the new system coming into place that it's failing is not going to secure the support that we need. What we do need is to have that immediate solution so that we can get over this current crisis. But we need to work with government on identifying what the more mid and long term solutions are. And that's where the MAC comes in. Now, the report has been shared with ministers and the NFU has sent a briefing on it to all MPs in the country. 
We've also provided a letter template for members to write their MPs and hit home the need for the emergency measures. And we're actually getting really good support from MPs. But as I said earlier, this is the most political issue and it needs continued pressure to make traction with number 10. Now, alongside MP engagement, the media coverage was significant. There were over 500 articles on the Labour report, including all of the major national press, and it had a reach of over 250 million people. Sadly, the response from government has been entirely underwhelming. Still, the Home Office talk about domestic recruitment first. Still, there is no movement on the seasonal worker scheme for 2022, although in recent weeks I am hearing that the conversations are at least getting uh, gaining more traction. Yet we're having more images of empty shelves and a very real threat that food will be in short supply through the winter. And it's not just Christmas turkeys that are under threat. So that's why the NFU called an emergency summit, summit earlier this week and has coordinated a letter to the Prime Minister on behalf of the same 12 organisations that backed the industry report to reinforce the ask on the COVID recovery visa. Now, in parallel to this, the NFU continues to push for the need for certainty on the seasonal worker scheme as soon as possible. Our evidence is now strong enough also to call for more visas. Um, just in case that's not clear, when we had an expansion to 30,000 visas, this year is a very different situation. Freedom of movement has now ended. We've had the um, settled status scheme. Obviously, we are very slowly coming out of COVID restrictions. So we've had to prove that this year, still 30,000 isn't enough. And I believe we've, we've got that now. Um, one of the pieces of evidence that supports that is the drop in returnee rates. Um, and that obviously goes in line with that max e mass exodus of EU nationals from the UK. 30,000 may have prevented a cliff edge this year. It will not prevent it next year or the year after that. So we need the government to genuinely engage with us on what the new number should be and how that will evolve in the coming years. We simply can't wait until winter every year to know what, if anything, we're going to get for the following year. Now, if the government th ever thinks we're crying wolf, this year has proven without a doubt that we are not. Shortages were bound to hit seasonal horticulture roles first, because why would anyone move away from home for short term work if they could secure a permanent job closer to home? But now those permanent roles are going unfilled, too. So what hope, therefore, has this sector got? So the seasonal worker scheme has never been about immigration. It's always been about recognising the uniqueness of seasonal work and accepting there's a good reason why all developed countries across the world bring overseas workers in. Politics is getting in the way of evidence and truth. So before I wrap up, I just want to uh, flag how, pe how you can help. We still need MPs banging the drum, and I'd encourage you to either use the e NFU's email tool or write separately to them uh, with the issues you're facing both across seasonal and permanent roles. One of the things that certainly gains traction is food waste. It's an issue that resonates not only with politicians, but also the media. So it's helpful to demonstrate where those products are being disposed of and why. Is it a lack of pickers or packers, or is it because of the haulage issues? The evidence is no longer in doubt. We now need to secure the political will to overcome the immediate crisis and address the medium to long term issues that will prevent this happening again. Um, I'm going to stop there. Um, this is an ongoing issue. Sadly, I suspect I'll be back here next year talking about it again and the challenges. Um, but it's something that we believe we can address and we need that political will to do it. And if you can help with pressure through MPs, that would be uh, very welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Lee. Uh, absolutely critical message, obviously. Um, it's one of the biggest challenges we've had this year. And as you correctly said, not an obvious answer to it. I mean, your point you made there about politics getting in the way of evidence and truth is absolutely sums it up. That's spot on. Um, we've had a couple of questions, if you've got time, Lee. Um, the first one was that, um, how can we address the British work workers shortage if British workers cannot secure rented property or a mortgage on even a short or temporary term uh, area offered, uh, for work offered by the sector. So even if those who want to go into our sector, maybe they're excluded because actually physically can't afford to move into it. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the key things that we have been saying, and actually DWP have, have, have effectively been saying it back to us, that one of the biggest challenges we've got is location. So um, if people have to move to go to a job or um, if they have to um, uh, commute, to go to one of these jobs, 
that is a significant barrier because as we've heard in the media for for weeks now um, there are tons of vacancies out there we are not the only industry struggling um, and all of the people that have the ability to to migrate to move or or to take on jobs have already done so it's the people that ha have the least ability to do that that are actually left uh, sort of on the books as it were um, the biggest barrier we've heard about is transport, for example. So unless there is suitable um, transport links or unless the person has a car, which in a lot of the job seekers cases they don't, then that is a significant barrier. It, it, it's a further demonstration that um, the workers, sorry, the job seekers out there in the UK either don't have the motivation to do this work or simply don't have the capability to, to travel uh, and get there. One possible solution is an industry... Um, coming together and putting on transport. But of course, a business wouldn't do that unless they can guarantee perhaps 20 people filling a minibus. If they think they're only going to get five people, is it worth it? Uh, and if three of them don't turn up on the third day, then it definitely isn't worth it. So yes, fully accept that. And fortunately, by working with DWP and getting direct feedback from job centres, we know that they get it too. Yeah, thank you, Lee. I agree with your points there. I mean, how do we as an industry help you and the NFU and the rest of the industry to get the message out there. I mean, you know, do we just lobby our MPs? Do we push representatives such as myself on the NFU Hope panel to come to feed that back to you or are there other areas that we should be feeding back? Yeah, again, because it's because it's so much of a political issue, the MP engagement, I think, is probably the number one ask. Um, what would be really useful, and I know this is very difficult for lots of businesses, is where they feel able to and, and brave enough to um, having case studies, having examples of the impacts on farm. So whether that is food being wasted, uh, product being, you know, uh, going to landfill because it couldn't be picked or it actually had been picked, but it simply couldn't be delivered. If we can bring these stories to life, that's even better. That has always been challenging. I know businesses don't want to sort of showcase themselves as a business that has that has had such challenges that they've disposed of product because you end up getting negative negative attention from NGOs. Um, but those businesses that are prepared to put their head up um, and speak out, actually, if they can make themselves known to us, because there is a, a ton of media interest in this. And of course, raise those with the MP as well. Bring the story to life. Um, don't just talk about it's challenging. Actually explain why it's challenging. I think that's when we get more cut through. Thanks very much, Lee. And I can say to everybody that uh, as, uh, as a representative of the TGA, I'm also sitting on the NFU Hort board. So I can take that message to Lee. So I'm happy to be the conduit to, to, to do that. It's absolutely vital that we do it. We can't complain about it afterwards if we're not banging the table as much as we possibly can now. Lee, I'm very conscious of your time commitments. Yeah. So I, Thank you. I'll, and apologies again for, for switching things around. Not a problem. Thanks. Everybody. A really important message. Lee, thanks very much indeed. Okay. As uh, Lee mentioned there, we've... Uh, I switched our agenda around rather and i'm very grateful to tim that i can see on my screen here who's hanging on very patiently to uh, to, to complete his uh, talk and presentation tim are you right to just to continue and then we'll pick a few questions up at the end maybe just uh, if you could right at the end of your presentation just a very quick overview so people can remember what it was you were talking about i apologize for that no problem am i back there can you hear me phil hello technical problems can you, can you hear me tim i can hear you phil yeah right we can hear you so over oh, to excellent. you that's all right sorry i wasn't <laughs> sure whether we we're all plugged in or not. um right route moving rapidly on I, I i my apologies as well i i did overrun and talk too much as, as usual so very quickly just i was i was on the net zero topic uh really moving into the steps that you might say for our team. do not forget about energy efficiency it's something that can slip the daft little things it's boring it's dull there's nothing quite as exciting as putting in a new biomass boiler or a heat pump but keep an eye on it keep up to date there are rarely any big wins left in energy efficiency hopefully you've all put thermal screens in and things like that but more often than not it's a good investment still and and, and it's quite a visible thing as well is, is it gets out tim i'm really sorry to interrupt you <laughs> we suddenly lost you can you just check your mic's not come unplugged um, we can just hear you, you've gone very faint. Oh, okay. Um, let me lean forwards a bit. How is that? Yeah, that's helping. Okay. 
Right, so I'll, I'll, I'll be louder than normal, which is rare. Um, yeah. <laughs> yes, please. Thanks, Tim. Energy efficiency, yeah. heat your eye on the ball, is, is the simplicity of, of that message. It's gone um, quieter and quieter. Keep, keep an eye on what's happening so they can be added more readily in the future. We, sorry, Tim, we, we lost you there. I'm really sorry. I can't believe we've lost the tech. You, you've been patient with us, and then the technology decided it doesn't want to hear from you. <laughs> the technology's got sick of me, that's the first. Um, <laughs> There you go. That, that's my summary page. Ho ho hopefully, you can see that. Yes. Brilliant. Brilliant. Th thank you very much, Tim. What I'll do, I'll t I'll talk over, and when I'm saying the wrong thing, wa wave loudly. Uh, that's, wave loudly. Wave largely, as I can see you. Um, so yeah, you, you've covered gas and the storm that will pass. She's uh, been horrendous this year, and is looking worse for next year. So what I'll do is I'll pick a few questions. And hopefully you can try and uh, try and answer them. If not, then what we'll have to do is uh, f feedback after the event. We're, I'm sorry, everybody, for these technical challenges. As I said earlier, next year we're definitely doing this face to face. And um, so one of the challenges we had, and it's one of the concerns I've had actually as well, is why do we have such low use of gas storage? I know rough storage was taken out a while ago. It's not going back in. That's two problems, isn't it? It's causing issues now with supply and demand. Also. If everybody tries to fill storage in next summer, that's going to push next summer's prices up, isn't it? Absolutely, and we're seeing that in terms of next summer's price being eighty odd pence. That's that's exactly what's driving it. The will, the the desire, the need to fill European storages that's, that's empty now. Have we not got me? Yeah, I think, I think, I think we've been beaten by our technology, Tim. I'm so sorry. Uh, w w what we'll do, everybody, we'll, we'll post the Tim's answers to, to the questions that have been posted, uh, and we'll, we'll pick it up on the TGA website uh, after the event. So I'm really sorry, uh, as I say, technology has beaten us on this occasion. Tim, I'm sure you can hear me, so please uh, accept our sincere uh, thanks and apologies for the technical problems, but thanks for, for, for putting the points across. Uh, with, there are loads of questions that are coming from people to watch in the event, which is a real shame that I'm not able to ask them of you. But we'll, uh, we will do it uh, via the website going forwards. Th Tim, thank you again. Okay, in that case, and what we're going to do is uh, just take a short break now, and we'll come back with the second session. Uh, and that session is going to start in uh, 20 minutes. So uh, if, you, if you take this opportunity to look at the trade stands, please. Uh, and, and make sure that we uh, support them because they are making sure that the, the uh, conference is, is funded and, and, and critical to it. Uh, yeah, and we'll, we'll see you back at uh, 11.30 for the next session. Thank you very much indeed. We've been growing tomatoes on this site for over 30 years and we still have these issues. Splitting can potentially be a very big problem. Quite commonly it can be 5% of total production. In terms of blossom air drop, and there'd be times when it can be up to say 50% of production and all that affects supply going into the supermarkets. Blossom air drop, even the scientists don't know absolutely exactly why it happens. So maybe watching the plant in real time is going to give us some real insights. So this is organic pickle, which is a cherry variety. Some of this goes into Waitrose with the Ducky brand. This is a stem diameter sensor. As the stem swells up, basically pushes the little needle in and it will measure down to a hundredth of a millimetre and sends the information to the cloud so we can then view that on our phones at any time. The light blue line here you can see is the sap flow starting to come up in the morning and the darker blue is the stem diameter. So we'll watch that across the day and see what happens.
We've been able to see the impact of when we start watering, when we open the screens which are in the roof of the glass house and we've seen that if we open them up too fast that will impact on the water uptake as well. We've been able to make quite a few work in practice changes with the sensors. There's quite a lot of potential for other growers to pick this up and use it in a range of different crops. Cucumbers and peppers could easily use this system. I think there's a slightly different sort of sensor that could be used in lettuces and maybe even strawberries as well. Without the support of Innovative Farmers, we wouldn't have been able to test this properly. Innovative Farmers has really helped the process. It will give us the business confidence for next year to continue.